Let's pray. God, you, um, you tell us concerning Jesus that the chief priests and the elders had sent people to arrest him. And they came back empty-handed. And the chief priest said, why did you not bring him in? And they responded, because no one ever spoke like this man. When Jesus speaks, he disarms the armed. And that's what we need this morning, God. We need to hear Jesus speak so that we can be disarmed. Lord Jesus, by your word, disarm us of our pride. Disarm us of our boastfulness. Disarm us of our calloused hearts. Disarm us of those things which keep us from hearing your words, the very words of life. Won't you do that for us, God, today? Through your word, I just pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that our Lord Jesus be magnified greatly in what is said today. And I pray that you give us hearts and minds to see and savor all that you are for us in the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, O Holy Spirit, that you make your presence felt this morning, that these people, that I can sense your guidance and your leading in the things that I say, God. And I just pray that you be with me especially. Help um, fleshly Jeremiah to stay out of the way. Left to myself, I will make a mess of this text. I'll make a mess of this message. And so I just present myself as a vessel to you, God. Use me. Show your magnificent glory in my cracks, in my deformities. Use this earthen clay pot to make your mighty name, name known to the people that are here, to the people that are online watching, the people that will listen later this week. Just show yourself mighty and true. Help us to feel your presence. And we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. What do you think is the proper way to judge the spiritual condition of a church? If you want to know whether or not a church is healthy, what do you look at? Do you look at how many people attend? Do you look at how big the budget is? Do you look at the ministry programs? What do you look at? What do you look at? What do you look at from a group of people to determine whether or not they're in a good state spiritually as a church? When you read the Apostle Paul, it's evident that he doesn't hold in high esteem or he doesn't value the things that we as people might highly esteem or value. We might value big budgets. We might value big numbers. We might value flashy worship services. We might value uh, various ministries, community outreach. There are numerous things that we value. There are numerous things that are important to us. There are numerous ways by which we judge success. And all I'm saying is that one must be very careful in thinking that the primary way in which we judge success is the way in which God judges success. Here are a sampling of verses of the Apostle Paul when he writes to, to various churches. This is Ephesians 1, 15-16. He says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. To the Colossians, in Colossians 1, 3-4, Paul writes this, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since or because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. There's, there's two words I want you to hear in these passages, and you, some of you may have already heard them, but in case you haven't, this is what he writes to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6-7, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love, reported that you always remember us, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. We have been comforted about you through your faith. And then again to the Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. When Paul sent for news concerning the church of God, 
the two realities with which he was primarily concerned were faith and love. That's what he wanted to know about them. He wanted to know how their faith was, and he wanted to know how their love was. That was and the reason for this is because that was Paul's charge in the ministry. The reason that Paul went about and taught the gospel was that the gospel produces both faith and love. And the way you determine whether or not a congregation is in good shape spiritually or even a viable group of people of God is, number one, is their faith growing and does their love for each other grow in proportion to that faith? Faith and love are the two primary realities concerning spiritual growth and spiritual being which Paul is concerned. And we know this because of what he says in 1 Timothy 1.5. Timothy, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So, so notice what Paul is saying here very carefully. Paul is not merely saying, nor does he say, that the primary charge of his gospel is acts of love. Like, I'm going to preach to you so that you can go out and be loving. That is my main goal. That's not at all what Paul says. It's not at all what he says. You can give your body to be burned and give away all that you possess and have not love and it profits you nothing. That's why Paul's primary concern is not that you look loving. Because you can look very loving and not be loving. You can do something loving like giving your body to be burned and it not be a loving act. That's reality. And that's why Paul doesn't say, I preach the gospel to you so you'll be more loving. The primary aim of Paul's charge is love that comes from the right source. That's why he says the aim of his charge is love that issues from a what? A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Paul is not at all interested in telling people to love without first telling them about the pure heart from which the love issues, which God has placed within them because of the work of Jesus Christ. Christ, if we do not understand that God first gives us a clean heart so that we can love and not the other way around, He doesn't give us a clean heart when we decide to be loving. He gives us a clean heart so that we can decide to be loving. If we don't understand that reality, we will attempt to obtain a pure heart for ourselves with the currency of loving others. If you don't understand that God has given you a good conscience so that you can love others in good conscience, then you will love others in an attempt to appease your bad conscience. If you don't understand that God has done something remarkable for you in the person of Jesus Christ that enables everything that you do for someone else in the name of Jesus Christ, you will take love and use it as a currency to obtain something from God that He has already given you freely in the person of Jesus Christ. Love is not a currency that we use to bargain with God to obtain something that we do not already possess, like a good or a, a, a clean heart or a good conscience or a sincere faith. Love is a fruit that we bear from God because we have been given freely by God that which we didn't previously possess, which is the Holy Spirit. This is Paul's burden for the Galatians, and it's my burden for you, and it's that you understand this reality. The aim of my charge as a preacher is not to give you the right answers to all of the difficult questions that you're asked. That's, that's not my charge. My charge as a preacher is not to make you feel more secure about your salvation or about your spiritual mentality by giving you a list of all the do's and don'ts so that you can do the things on the list and say, I'm in good shape. Or that you can look at the don'ts and say, I'm in terrible shape. That's not the aim of my charge. The aim of my charge is love that issues forth from a pure heart, from a clean conscience, and a sincere faith. For if love issues forth from any other source, it's not love, it's legalism. That's the difference. If love doesn't come from a clean heart, a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith, your acts of love are legalist, legalistic acts. They're not loving at all. The gospel images forth the means by which we're given pure hearts, 
the means by which we're given good consciences, the means by which a true faith is produced. And then, in light of what has been done for us, it gives us feet with which to run to do acts of good love. The gospel is not the good news of what you do for yourself to get clean hands and good feet that will help you love others. The gospel is the good news of what's been done for you that gives you clean hands and feet that help you run to love other people. It's not the other way around. And so there are three aims of today's message. Here's the first one. To build your faith by showing you that the Christian life is a struggle that is lived in deep dependency on God and not self and by showing you that the struggle in which you are now entailed does not have the last say. The second, to glorify God through the person of Jesus by showing how our embracing of Christ's finished work on our behalf is instrumental in bearing the fruits of the Spirit, which includes love. And lastly, to equip you with some practical ways to walk by the Spirit, and so love God and love your neighbor. Those are the three aims, and this is Galatians 5, 16 through 24. And we'll, be, we'll begin by looking at Galatians 5, 16 through 18. It says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under law. So there are, there are two D's. All right, two D words that I, just, that I see in this verse. And here's the first one. Notice the primary battle that we fight is waged on the battlefield of desire. The word desire occurs twice explicitly and once implicitly in these two verses. Walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the, the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. The fundamental problem with fallen humanity is that we desire other things more than God. That is our fundamental flaw. Fundamentally, the problem with every person that hasn't been changed by the Spirit is they don't desire that which they should desire ultimately. That's the problem. There is a God who exists in reality who is infinitely more beautiful than anything that the total sum of the world's most creative minds could ever create. He is wiser and understands more than the total sum of the world's most brilliant minds could ever reckon or ever comprehend or ever understand. He exerts more strength in the batting of his eyelids than the total sum of all the world's strongest men could ever exert or have in all of their lifetimes combined. By the words of his power, every created thing was brought into existence. And by the words of his power, every created thing goes on existing. If you're breathing, it's because he has said breathe. If you are blinking, it's because he has said blink. If you're moving, it's because he said moves. And he declares these decrees and holds the entire created existence in order every single millisecond of every single day. Yet we find more joy and wonder in a movie than we do in this God. We find more joy and satisfaction in watching a football game or playing around on our iPhones than we do in the beholding the glory of this God. This is our condemnation, and there will be no other condemnation levied other than this one. The reason that an incalculable number of people will spend eternity in hell is because they find more joy and desire more greatly Satan's trinkets, and they push off with a stiff arm the greatest treasure imaginable the infinitely valuable glory of God this is our problem we don't desire the right things but there is really good news when we are born of the spirit our desires are graciously changed by God that's why he promises us a new heart in Ezekiel 36 26 and 27 I'll put a new heart within them That's what he means. In other words, my people in the Old Covenant were plagued by their distaste and their distrust of me. But in the New Covenant, that will not exist because I will change their desire for me. What Paul wants to make painstakingly clear in these 
three verses is that when we receive our new heart and spirit, the struggle with the flesh ensues still. That, that's the point. You don't receive your new heart and your new spirit and then just walk freely doing the things that you should desire to do that are godly and loving the one you should want to love who is God. It's just not the way it works. The, the struggle is real. I see that on Facebook all the time. The struggle is real, man. The struggle is real in the flesh and the spirit. It's a real struggle. And this is so important. If you find yourself fighting a battle between two separate and distinct sets of desires, this battle is not evidence that you're not a child of God. The battle is evidence that you are a child of God. The fact that you have desires that originate from the Spirit is a testimony to the fact that you have been born of the Spirit. The reason that Paul tells us that the flesh and its desires are so against the Spirit that they never produce spiritual desires and that the Spirit and its desires are so against the flesh that they never produce spiritual desires is because he wants us to know that the presence of spiritual desire in our lives means something, namely that we're born of the Spirit. That which is flesh is flesh. That's what Jesus says in John 3. And what he means is this. That which is flesh is flesh. It begins as flesh. It goes on as flesh. It continues as flesh. And it ends in flesh. The flesh only begets flesh. But that which is spirit is spirit. It starts as spirit. It continues in spirit. It ends in spirit. The spirit only begets spirit. The flesh only begets flesh. So if you're walking in the flesh and you are desiring spiritual things, what Paul wants you to know is that spiritual desire is not the product of your flesh. The flesh doesn't work that way. It begets flesh, begets flesh, begets flesh. But if there are spiritual desires inside of you and there's a war raging inside of you about what your spirit wants to do and about what your flesh wants to do, you know those spiritual desires are inside of you because God has put them there. It's impossible for the flesh to produce it. That's the point. The struggle is real, man. It's real. And it's not evidence that you're lost. It's just evidence that God's not finished with you yet. The more you walk in faith, the greater the fleshly desires diminish and the spiritually desires increase. But when you first start walking by the Spirit, it's almost as if they're just right here and it's a battle. But what does this mean? Well, walk by the Spirit and you will never ever fulfill the desires of the flesh. Even though we are in a great battle, there's a means by which we can win, and that's walking by the Spirit. That's the solution. The problem is that there's this great battle. The solution is, hey, there's a way that you can win it, and it's walking by the Spirit. But what does it mean to walk by the Spirit? And this brings us to the second D in this section, which is a lot more difficult to discern because it's not explicit. It's truly implicit, and it is dependency. The promise of victory over the flesh and its desires is given to those who depend on the Spirit to lead them in their walk. And we see it in Galatians 5.18 when he uses the passive verb. If you are being led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The reason he uses the, the, the usage of a passive verb there is very, very important. It indicates that the subject is being acted upon. So being led by the Spirit is being acted upon to have you, the Spirit lead you. So walking by the Spirit is an, is an active verb. Being led by the Spirit is a passive verb. And Paul used them interchangeably because they are indeed the same reality. To walk by the Spirit is to be led by the Spirit. The only way you walk by the Spirit is being led by the Spirit. Because if you're not walking by the Spirit, you're walking by the flesh. And the only way to walk by the flesh is to be led by it. One only walks by the Spirit when they're led by the Spirit. And so what Paul wants us to see is that, yes, this battle is real, And this Christian life that God calls us to live is not a life of independence. In fact, the difference in those that live by the flesh and those who live by the Spirit is that those who live by the flesh are led by themselves and are left to themselves. Those who live by the Spirit are led by the Spirit of God and connected to God. So here's an illustration to to, to try to describe. It's not perfect. All analogies break down. But imagine a line of first grade School children, okay? Teacher is just has the terrible responsibility and duty 
very little delight in marching these children down the hall for a bathroom break. And so she gets all 25 first graders, and she says, okay, you're going to follow me, stand in a line, and take your right hand, point your finger, and put it over your mouth, because I don't want to hear you say anything. Right? And so they start off in this line down the hall, each student walking by their own power. And what happens? Hands go off mouths. They go on to other children. They try to trip the other children. The line zigzags. These people are being led by a teacher. But the problem is, is there's no real connection to the teacher except what the teacher commands. So they're walking by the teacher, and in a sense they're being led by the teacher, but they're left to themselves. And as long as the teacher doesn't see them, they can pull hair, scratch, claw. It doesn't matter. As long as they don't talk, the teacher probably doesn't know what's going on. That's what living in the flesh is like. Living in the flesh is just walking in a line, zigzagging, having your hands go wherever they want to go, going whatever direction you want to go in. And there's supposedly some power out there that says, follow me, but you just you can't because you're not connected to it. Now imagine an identical scenario, but instead of having the students hold one finger over their mouth, the teacher takes the hand of the student that's directly behind her and she says, okay, grab the hand of the person that's behind you and we're going to walk down the hall. The hands are no longer over their mouth. They're connected to the teacher, and they walk. The students are still the ones walking actively, but now, for the first time, the students are actually being led as they walk because they have a connection to the one that's leading them. This is the way God deals with us. He doesn't lead us like a first grader leads school children with their hands over their mouth. He leads us like a... a, a First grade teacher leads her school children by grasping the hand of her student and having all the other students being connected to her by them grasping other people's hands. They're connected to this teacher. They're walking and being led a completely different way. When we're led by the Spirit, we walk in such a way, get this, and if it doesn't blow your mind, it should. We're walking in such a way that we are connected to the divine. That's what it means. When you walk by the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, you experience a connection with the divine, with God Almighty, who discerns our thoughts from afar, who knows the words in our mouths before they're even on our tongue. we, We experience a connection with Him through the Holy Spirit. And you're not left to wander off and hurt others with your hands because you're connected to a source of guidance and love and righteousness and peace, which is why these virtues in verses 22 and 23 are called fruits of the Spirit. Or to say it more biblically, the best example, I am the vine, you are the branches, says Jesus. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you don't remember anything of what I said thus far, remember this. Christ never follows you to call him alone, ever, ever, ever. He doesn't do that. That's not the way he works. He asks you to follow him and gives you the means by which you can follow him, the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is what causes the struggle between the desires of the flesh and the spirit. And God hasn't put you in the middle of a losing battle. He's defeated your greatest enemy and has given you the Holy Spirit with which to vanquish all your lesser ones. Isn't this great news? That God took care. He took care of your greatest enemy, which was you. Your your greatest enemy isn't Satan. There's nothing that he can say that will send you to hell. Your greatest enemy is you. Because there are things you can do and things that you cannot or things you won't believe that will send you to hell. And if God took care of your biggest problem in the new birth, which was you, then you can be confident that He has taken care of all the lesser ones. So, have your faith uplifted. Aim to. We want to glorify God through the person of Jesus Christ by showing how our embracing of Christ's finished work on our behalf is instrumental in bearing the fruits of the Spirit. Christ died for us so that we could fill the righteous requirement of the law, which is love. I think that one of the reasons that Paul puts both of these lists here, a vice list and a virtue list, 
is he wants us to see how important it is that we fulfill the righteous requirement of the law and what was done on our behalf so that we could go about fulfilling the law. I think it's folly to look at this and say, okay, well, we no longer fulfill any part of the law. I think that's Paul's point. If it were his point, he wouldn't have said this in Galatians 5, 13 through 14. You were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In other words, serve one another through acts of love. Why does he tell them this? There's the ground, the four. Four, here's why I'm telling you this. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, even though we are under grace and not law, we're not exempt from fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law. In other words, you being unloving is not optional. It's not optional, even though you're under grace. The difference in being under law and being under grace is is this. Those under grace fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, which is love, by trusting in Christ's finished work on their behalf and the promise of the empowerment that flows from that work. That's what it means to be under grace. It doesn't mean that you can't fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. It means that you're going to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law in a way in which God's grace is magnified and not your works. Namely, by going to the cross, by looking at the finished work of Jesus Christ and trusting that promise and trusting that righteousness and living in light of this reality. That's what it means to fulfill the, law, the royal law of love by grace. Conversely, those of the flesh trust in their own ability to love. That's what I think is in Paul's mind, is that the fulfillment of the law is necessary, but the way in which one fulfills it determines what power they're under. You can be under the power of sin and death or the power of grace and life. But how do, I, how, how do we know this? Well, that's, the first way I, I think that this is right is because of the two lists that are given. Two lists in Galatians 5, right? Verses starting in verse 19 through 24. One is a vice list, the other is a virtue list. And if you notice how the list of vices are, are summarized or, comp, or composed, rather, it becomes evident that the vices are listed in, in the lumped into three categories. Here's the first one sexual immorality, impurity, and sensuality. All sexual sins. So the first, the first category in this list of vices have to do with sexual sins. The next two are idolatry and sorcery. And then the final nine are enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. And what each of these lists, each of the sections of this vice list have in common is lack of love. The sexual immorality list indicates that people of the flesh do not even love themselves properly since the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. So what Paul says first and foremost is your main problem in not loving others first and foremost is you don't love yourself. The presence of sexual sins among you shows me that you hate you. The second category deals with our loving of stuff over God. Idolatry and sorcery were used as a means to coerce God into giving the worshiper what he or she greatly desired. So if you were infertile, what you would do is you would go and you would have sex in front of an idol to the God of fertility so that she could see what you've done and then somehow change her attitude towards you so that you could have a baby. In other words, I'm going to use God to get what I want. He is not the end to which all other things work. He's just the means to a greater end. That is the definition of idolatry. Not seeing God as the ultimate end, but as a means to some end that is greater. So those who do not love themselves do not love God. And finally, the last list is the most clear to see. People of the flesh don't love others. Divisions, jealousy, rivalries, dissension, strife occurs when we don't love each other like we should. Therefore, it shouldn't come as any surprise when Paul says, I warn you now, even as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the reason they won't inherit the kingdom of God is because these people and the practicing of these things do not fulfill the law of love, but rather fulfill the law of hate. They hate themselves, they hate God, and they hate everybody else. 
But in contrast to the vice list stands a list of virtues, which are called fruits of the Spirit. And they include love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Acts of love and kindness that are both the opposite and the alternative of the acts of hate that occur on the other list. So if you don't want to have an outburst of wrath against somebody, the way to do that is to be more patient with them. That's the way it works. You can take these two lists and see in the fruits of the spirits an alternative action that overcomes one of the other ones on the list of vices. They're different, and they are fruits that are bore by being connected to the Spirit, fruits produced by the Spirit. But instead of there being a warning at the end of this list, like those who inherit such things will not enter the kingdom of God, Paul says, and against these things, there is no law. So the lists are similar, in a way, but yet they're infinitely different. One ends with a warning, the other ends with a statement. So what does it mean that those who do these things or against there is no law against these things? It means at least two things. First, it means that prohibitions of bad behavior do not guarantee the practice of good behavior. That's what it means. It means, as I went saw the imitation game Friday, about a man who was laden with homosexuality, that was against the law in Britain, and it was their law that there be no homosexual people. It's against the law. And so for punishment, they gave him a year of hormone therapy. He committed suicide later. What Paul is saying here is that laws against certain behaviors don't guarantee right behaviors. You can't fight God's war with the devil's weapons. And if you try to legislate that which comes as a fruit of the Spirit, through legislation, you're taking the devil's weapon, which is legislation, and trying to bring about something about uh, something so that only God himself can produce, which is the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, you, you don't get good behavior by better law. It doesn't work that way. If the royal law of God, which prohibits sexual immorality like homosexuality, could not cause people to be, or not to be, or to cease to be homosexuals, then what man-made law can do it? There's not one. Only the gospel can do it. That's the point. That's one of the points. Here's the second point. By saying there is no such law against the fruits that are bore by those who walk according to the Spirit, Paul's actually saying that the righteous requirement of the law is being fulfilled by those who bear the fruits of the Spirit. The people in this group have fulfilled the law, which is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But the question is, how do they do it? How do they bear this fruit? What makes the people of the Spirit different than those of the flesh? And the answer is given in verse 24 when Paul says this, Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passion and desire. So Paul tells us of fruits that fulfill the law, and then immediately afterwards, he carries them right back to the cross. And the question is, why? The reason is because something happened at the cross that made this fruit-bearing spirit available to us. And this is what we're told in Romans 8, 1 through 4. And you can turn there if you like. Um, Romans 8, 1 through 4, it's on page 944 in your pew Bible. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that great news? For those of you who are in Christ Jesus, guess what the Apostle Paul speaks over you? No condemnation. There's none. You do not sit here in Christ Jesus condemned. There's no condemnation for you. Here's why. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Both laws correspond to one another. Spirit corresponds with sin. Life corresponds with death. In other words, there was a power of sin and death under which you once lived, but now you live in Christ Jesus under the power of the Spirit and of the power of life. You've been transferred from one power that leads to death under another power that leads to life. Great news. And this is how it happened. God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His Son son, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. God, in the sending of Jesus Christ, condemned our sin in the flesh of Jesus. Our sin was condemned in the flesh of Jesus, and since He bore the penalty of that sin, we don't have condemnation in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus bore that on our behalf, but He does it for a reason. Look at the in order of that. It's a purpose clause. 
in order that, here we go, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who's the us? Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God sent Jesus to conquer our sin in His flesh so that through Jesus we could conquer our struggle with sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. The reason that Paul mentions our death to the old self by association with the cross of Jesus Christ at the end of the virtue list is because we can only continually kill our old self at the cross of Jesus Christ. If you want something that's in you that's old to die, you cannot kill it anywhere else other than Calvary. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our victory over the flesh occurs progressively as we live in light of the protection and the provision and the redemption that Christ Jesus purchased on our behalf. And if you're not living in light of the greatest act of love that was made on your behalf, you do not have the ability to love others with the same love with which you yourself have been loved. That's the point. If, if you're not living in light and experiencing victory over the flesh in light of what Christ has done for you, you can't love others with the same love with which you've been loved. It's impossible. Those who do not love do not know God because God is love. People who aren't loving, the reason they don't love is because they don't know who God is. You don't love in order to find out who God is. You have to be shown who God is so that you can love. That's why God's glorified in this virtue list. And that's the reason Paul puts the crucifixion immediately after the virtue list. So that we wouldn't be fooled into thinking that these are virtues that we can just do on our own. If you want to bear this fruit... You've got to go to the cross because that's the tree from which the fruit grows. Crucify the old self with his passion and desire. So, practically, how are we led by the Spirit? Notice that Paul says, I'm almost done, his new life is lived by faith in the Son of God. I live, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's old life he lived was lived in faith in himself, in Paul. Paul's new life he lived is lived by faith in someone else. That's the difference in old Paul and new Paul. Old Paul saw old Paul as sufficient. New Paul saw, saw, sees Jesus Christ as sufficient. That's the difference. The key to being led by the Spirit is this. Live and walk by faith. This is what we see in Galatians 3, 3-6. Having begun by the Spirit, that's how everybody begins. If you're in Christ, you know how you began? By the Spirit. You, you began in the Spirit. In the Spirit. That's how your new life begins, in the Spirit. Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law? Or does He do it by hearing with faith? The one who supplies the Spirit to you, supplies the Spirit to you, by hearing with faith. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means that the more you hear God, and the more you believe God, and the more you trust in the sufficiency of God, the greater amount of the Spirit you receive. The amount of Spirit you are led or controlled by rises and falls in proportion with your faith. Paul gives you the Spirit by hearing with faith. So when you hear all these precious promises quoted and read this morning. If you believe those and you li live life in light of those, a great measure of the Spirit is poured out as you hear with faith and you walk by that Spirit. When we submit to God's Word and will in our lives as authoritative, the Spirit is supplied in appropriate measure. The only way to live by the Spirit is live by faith. Because if you don't have faith, you don't get the Spirit. So, three resolutions to live by. And here's the first. Resolve to believe that Christ's death was so sufficient for your sins and redemption that you cannot add anything to it. That's the first promise to believe. If you want to live by the Spirit, you have to believe this promise. 
Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. Christ's sacrifice is enough. And there's no other act I can do that adds to that sacrifice. It doesn't matter how many times I come here and take communion. It doesn't matter how many times I say the sinner's prayer. I can be baptized once, twice, three, four times. There's nothing I can do that adds an iota to what Christ has already done. And if we don't believe this, we will not keep the source of our power to fight sin properly in view. What Romans 8, 1 through 4 shows us is this. The only sin that can be conquered is one that has been forgiven. You don't conquer sin in order to be forgiven of that sin. God conquers. God forgives you of that sin so that you can conquer that sin. If the opposite were true, then Christ died for no purpose. If you could, could defeat a sin that you hadn't been forgiven of, why did Christ die? He died to take away your sin, to offer forgiveness for the sin so that you can conquer the sin. Don't leave the life and believe the lie that you have to conquer all your sins in order to get forgiveness. No, you receive forgiveness, removal of your sins, your trespasses from the blood of Christ so that you can conquer them. Number two, resolve to believe that if God did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for us all, that He will, not, he will also give us with Him all things. One of the reasons that we don't love others with the kind of sacrificial love that God requires is because we're afraid that our resources to love will run out. That's why we don't love. We're afraid that we won't have enough to love. That God has only given us this, and if we give it to somebody else, then He won't give us anything else and we won't be able to take care of ourselves. And so what happens is, is we withhold from other people what we need because our heart is desperately afraid of losing what we have. And the reason that God shows himself as a giving God and not withholding is so that you can take these great risks to love others and know that God is always on the other side to supply what he demands. Resolution number three, resolve to read and memorize God's word and call the promises to mind consistently and continually. This last one is perhaps the one on which all the other ones hinge. If you don't know the Word, you can't live by the Spirit. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show His handiwork. Night to, night to night pours out speech, and day to day knowledge. There is no place where their voice is not heard. All of humanity has heard the declaration of the glory of God. But if they hear it apart from the revealed glory in the person of Jesus Christ made explicit in the word they've only heard enough about God to send them to hell you can go out in the woods and wait for a butterfly to land on your shoulder or a squirrel to run across the street at a certain time or look for rocks that are in the shape of hearts or look at the waters right you can do all those things and in all those things see glory and not know who god is and not hear from god because you don't know the word does god speak to us through nature absolutely but only as much as his word is inside of us we put these truths inside of us and it helps us to understand how the world works and relate it back to god and thus we're filled by the spirit you don't hear from the Spirit of God unless it's in tandem with what God has, has been revealed in His Word. His truth, the person of His Son. So, believe Christ's death was so sufficient for your sins or redemption that you can't anything to it. Believe that if God did not spare His own Son but gave Him up for you, He will give you all things with Him. And let's resolve to read and memorize God's word and call them to mind consistently and ask for God's help in doing so. This isn't some kind of, please don't think this is some kind of like assembly sheet. Like you would go purchase a gas grill, you know how to put it together. You bring out the instructions. Here's how you live by the Spirit. That's not what this is. It's not the way God works. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. This is a list of practical best practices that God may see fit to use for you. And then again, he may see fit to use something completely different for you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that you love us, that you gave us your only son, that you give us your spirit to live inside of us, to lead us, to guide us. And I pray that you help us to listen for your word. Help us to discern and test the spirit in community and groups. Help us to not be like Elijah all alone in his cave. 
but help us to take what God says and to take counsel with you in prayer, with your word, and with other people who have been given the power of the Holy Spirit so that we might know the way in which we should walk. God, forgive us for not producing fruit more. It's because we're not connected to you like we should be. Help us to stay connected to you and your word. And thank you for Jesus, our great hope, the one who took our sins, carried our sorrows to the cross so the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. And thank you for the group of people here today. Thank you for their patience with me, their willingness to hear your word. And I pray that you minister to their hearts and their situations and in their spirit in a way that only you can. I pray this in Jesus' name.